Hi, my name is Alan Horvat. In this video, I will show you what happens when .NET needs to resolve a call to a virtual function. This is the continuation of the previous video in which we have implemented a very simple model with only two classes and two virtual functions, and you have seen how .NET is resolving calls to virtual functions when a function is overridden or not. Please watch that video. If you like what you learn from this video, please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to tick the bell so that you receive notifications when new videos are uploaded. Also, what you'll learn in this video is part of a much larger video course published at Udemy. If you want to really learn what happens when you write object-oriented code, how does that code get executed, why do objects work, please enroll to that course, use the link from the description that will give you a huge discount, and let's, let's step to code. This is the piece of code as we left it in the previous video. There are two classes, base and derived, with two virtual methods. One method is overridden in the derived class, and uh, when the report method above is invoked, it will behave differently depending on which particular object was passed to it. If it was the base type, then virtual functions from the base class will be resolved and executed, and if we passed the derived instance, then the body of the overridden method from the derived class will be executed. That is how virtual functions work in any object-oriented language, including c -sharp. But how does .NET resolve addresses or bodies or implementations of virtual functions? That's what you will learn in this video. I will implement the, the underlying mechanism which exists in every object-oriented language, including c -sharp. The crux of the solution is in a special element which I will call the virtual function. I will just represent it with a delegate which receives some parameters and returns some result. The trick in resolving virtual functions is in attaching special metadata to every single object in the system. And in the least, those metadata will contain what is called a virtual functions table or v table. I will implement it as a dictionary. It's not really implemented as a dictionary in uh, .NET, but for the sake of demonstration, it will look easier if it were a dictionary. So it will map a name of the virtual function into an actual body or implementation of that function. Where do we stick? these metadata in an object. Implicitly, every object will have a separate field for the metadata. I will implement it here by deriving all classes from this implicit layout. There is no really a base class like this, but when compiler compiles your code, it will behave as if there were a special base class above all other classes. The result of this is that the first element in the object layout will effectively be the metadata, a reference to a metadata object, for, which is appropriate for that object. So base will have this metadata here, and so will the derived object have them. But the trick in resolving virtual functions is that these two references will be different in the base and in the derived type. What will these metadata contain? I will now populate them. I will do that in the constructor. You will see later that this is not really appropriate, but just for the sake of demonstration to, to show the working principle of uh, resolving virtual functions, Let's implement that in the constructor. A constructor will implicitly call the base constructor, so anything that needs to be initialized 
in the base type will already be initialized by the time this constructor begins executing. In other words, there will be metadata. Empty metadata, but there will be a reference to them. So now we need to register virtual functions of this class in the metadata so that the later concrete bodies, concrete implementations of the virtual functions can be resolved. I will add a helper function to do this. There will be a helper function which uh, accepts a function name and its concrete implementation as a func delegate. And it just adds it to the dictionary, no nothing special. There will be a name to function implementation mapping inside the metadata pointed to by this instance. That is very important. So every instance will effectively have potentially different map of virtual functions. So when it comes to initializing the base class, we will just register the what do I do method, the virtual method, with its own body. And what happens in the derived class? It will implicitly inherit the initialization done by the base class, which means registered what do I do method with the body, with the implementation that was defined in the base class. And that's not what we want. So we override that. We overwrite the dictionary entry with a different lambda, with a different function implementation. And that is overriding. There will be no what I do function method defined on the derived class, nor the one above in the base. There's only the V table, which contains functions by their name, indexed by their names. So the question is, now how do we call, how do we make this call above? This doesn't compile anymore. This doesn't compile anymore because we don't know which function needs to be invoked. That function must be found at runtime before it can be executed. That is the virtual function resolution mechanism which this video is all about. The resolution is done by, guess what, the runtime. The .NET runtime will help us with that. It will expose a special function which I will call call. That is a function which calls virtual functions. And what does this runtime utility need from us to make a call to a function. First, it needs an instance on which we want to invoke a virtual function. So now you see already where this is heading. Virtual function resolution can only be done at the runtime when we have an object, not the type of the reference that points to that object, because that would be uh, a false information. That's, that's not how we can resolve the virtual function. We need an object. And then we need a method name on that object, which to call, plus the arguments to pass to that, to that method. And then the resolution begins in a very peculiar way. We start from the instance, and get into its metadata. Now you remember that every object has a metadata that are specific to its own type. So base object will have one metadata, derived object will have a different metadata. And then we get into the V table, find the method in this demo implementation, we find it by name, and that is the virtual function the concrete implementation we were looking for. Again, this process will yield one function body in the base class object and a different function body in the derived class object. So we just invoke whatever the function we resolved and return the result it created. That's it. What does this call look like then? 
Now it boils down to asking the runtime to resolve a function on the instance x called what do I do and give us the result of whatever the function it was. This is how virtual functions are executing at runtime in reality. You don't write any of this code, but all this code will exist. It is part of the .NET runtime. And whenever you invoke a virtual function, something like this will effectively run in the background, so the proper function body will be resolved, function implementation, and when I run this, you will see that my code is also working correctly. So, here you have learned the working principle of virtual function resolution. The problem with my demo implementation is that it is initializing metadata in the, cons in the object constructor. So every time I create a new instance, the same metadata will be constructed again. That is wasteful and that is not what uh, .NET really does. What I'm missing is a proper implementation of the .NET runtime, which should do that for us. So, in the next video, I will effectively implement the core of the .NET runtime so that you can see what happens when you call the new operator on a class to construct a new instance, what happens under the hood, how the metadata are being constructed exactly once, and again, if you really want to learn this topic in depth to really understand what happens when you write and execute object-oriented code, then please enroll to my video course Beginning Object-Oriented Programming with C Sharp at Udemy. Use the link from the description to get the discount for that course and enjoy learning. See you in the next video when we will discuss construction of the .NET runtime.